Hello, Warriors. It's Jody with Warriors Rise. And today we have an amazing guest, John Fennon, for a second time. I am so blessed. But before we get speaking to each other, let's speak to the most important guest of all, the Holy Spirit. So, Father, we come before you in the mighty name and the glorious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. I thank you, Father, for this time that I have with my brother, John. He is such a blessing to so many. I pray that you bless him, Father, and anoint him with such a double portion for this time. I thank you, Lord, that we invite your spirit to be with us, that every word of truth that goes out will touch and pierce the heart of someone who needs to know you in a special way. I thank you, Father, that you meet every need of those listening, Lord God, that your son's name is above poverty. It's above sickness and disease. It's above all of the stresses that the enemy may throw at us today. So we invite you, Lord, to be with us and let your words hold the power and not return to you void. I thank you for this time. In Jesus Christ's mighty name, we pray. Amen and amen. 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 Well, my brother, I love having you back. <laughs> 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 thank you so i was just making sure i've got i'm all set here i yeah, think I no, am. So no glare glad to be back me. jody thank you <laughs> so um you know i was telling you how <clears throat> the last time you were on people were blessed and that one specific lady was uh blessing me that you blessed her about how intimate you are with the father and i have that kind of relationship with him too i just love the father so much i could cry but um it touched her in a time of need and I, and so what we do even though it may we may not see the results. God is moving through the airwaves to get to the people. And so right. I want to thank you for coming on again. So do you want to tell people about you and where you can be found? And then we'll get into our subject matter. Okay, sure, sure. <laughs> um, I'm not sure where to start. Just real briefly, uh, after 25 years in the auditorium church, always in ministry and some in business, but um, I was searching for how... Uh, the early church did church, how Paul did church, and the Lord visited me uh, twice in, in 2001. And uh, one of them, the first, yeah, get back to the start to answer your question. See, go to our website, cwowi.org. If I spend too much time talking about that, Jody will not get to the, <laughs> the crux of what we want to get to. So okay. cwowi.org, we're a house church network. We celebrate the gathering of the saints, like I like to say, in homes. Yeah. Uh, nothing wrong with the auditorium, but the way they did it from the day of Pentecost until uh, being legalized by Rome some 300 years later was they met at homes. Yeah. They wrote, they took turns leading. They took turns hosting. And uh, I think Acts 2.42 kind of summarizes it, that they were continually and steadfastly in the apostles' teaching, fellowship, food, and prayer. Amen. And those four okay. elements, very simple. <laughs> so you can also see me. I do a weekly, I do a weekly short teaching on YouTube as well mm -hmm. in our super house church channel. I do a, a short five to 18 minute teaching every Wednesday that's posted. So you You're can right. see me here. You can see me there. So yeah. Amen. And I want to <laughs> just say that house church, uh, church without walls, international church without walls, international. My so C-W-O-W-I is that acronym. So that's you right. can find it easy. But uh, I was listening to someone, a minister yesterday, and they were saying that uh, they believe that the statistic is now nine out of 12 Christians worldwide are being prosecuted, arrested. One guy got arrested for reposting something because someone reported him as get, they were offended and given anxiety. So the church needs to stand up. And at some point we may have to do the very thing you're talking about, you know, and, and meet in churches and um, that are in homes rather than the gathering of the body rather than the you know auditorium church you, you know let me interject this a lot of people think that house church is because of persecution and that's why they did it in the first century and that's not the case at all um, yeah uh, it was part of the synagogue system mm -hmm. which began a couple hundred years before jesus as a means of educating the jewish people on what it is to be jewish mm -hmm. and so the the revival that happened during uh, what became hanukkah and uh, the maccabees john hyrcanus some of the others who led that was to start uh, in as long as they, they wanted 10 families or 10 adult males, that is age 13 and up and above. And they, these leaders traveled around and taught the word and they rotated homes, they rotated, rotated who led. And so by the time of Jesus, by the time of the book of Acts, they just stayed in that same synagogue system of meeting in homes. Yeah. And it, it, 
is helpful during times of persecution, but that's not why they do it. They do it because the first house church was Adam, Eve, and the Lord in the garden. Yeah, and uh, he he never left. He I never left that. the home. So I it's not a new invention at all. Yeah, <laughs> I love that wealth of information. <laughs> so you always thought you always yeah. teach me so much. Um, yeah, I, and I do love that. And it it and they gave everything to each other. Like uh, how many times I've seen people where the Lord spoke to them and said, this one needs help, help them. And they were like, I don't know, Lord. And they went off on their own and never helped that person. And they lost everything they had. And, um, I mean, literally lost a home with four children. And, but anyway, so we we want to be like the, the church where we do minister life to each other in many ways, you know? So, um, and I like the intimacy of the of the home church. That's what it's all about. It's really a lifestyle. A relationship yeah. based faith is a lifestyle. Yeah. With, um, it's it's not a relationship with a building, the auditorium, but uh, it's relationship with each other. So you do get to know. It's not that you're in each other's lives because you maintain your privacy, your property, your right. your family, and everything. But you are connected mm -hmm. to where everybody knows there's a safety net, and if there's a need larger than they can handle. They've got a network of support and mm -hmm. that is so fulfilling. And so it, it affirms you differently. You mm -hmm. know, if you go to the auditorium church, what makes you feel secure and comfortable and everything could be the stained glass, could be the pew, could be the, the order of, of every service being the same. Um, but in a house church or relationship based faith, you're actually, your, your affirmation as a Christian comes through Christ being in other people. Because right. we're all the living, breathing temples of God. And so it's a different way of being, of having your faith confirmed and then affirming you as an individual. But uh, anyway, changed my life. And, um, you know, Jody, a lot of people realize that the Lord has been appearing to me since I was uh, 20, whatever I was. <laughs> In the age six, I was 26, 28 years old. Wow. Um, and, uh, and so you know, a lot of what I teach and a lot of what I share is for, is, is are things I've been taught that yeah. no other, no, nobody taught me, or I didn't sit in a, a conference and keep notes or anything like that. And, uh, and there's a fair amount of digging I do. I love research and everything like that, but that only enhances my walk with the father and my walk with the Lord. So, exactly. and it's very, it's very, uh, humbling isn't even the right word. You just, when you really have been before the father or you see the lord you know he's god you're not yeah. and and you just throw yourself on the mercy of the court you know so to yeah. speak and you say here i am Down, right? and he, he accepts me and he accepts you and yeah. he accepts all of us and it's so humbling so you just you just yeah. accept it and move on yeah, yes. and he loves us so much. I mean, from the beginning yeah. of time, he brought heaven to earth to to dwell with Adam in the garden. They walked together, they talked together. And then when sin came, he he said, build a tabernacle and I'll dwell here, you know, and but sin separated us. So we had to do it a certain way. And then through Christ, he dwells within us. I mean, it, all right. his love for us is so intense. All he wants is to be with us. He could have stayed in heaven with the angels he created and, you know, and the Enochs of the day or whatever, but instead he keeps reaching to live with mankind and to love us. And he just, uh, I could cry. I, I just love him. So <laughs> I could cry. I could. Cause that kind of love I need in my life, you know, and I'm so glad he gives it to us all. Yeah. Now I wanted to talk to you about a, a few things we shared. Um, uh, you did a teaching once on do people, in heaven know what's going on here on earth um and i wanted to have you address that because sometimes i hear people say yeah and i you know and i i ask my aunt who died to pray for us and and i'm like oh we've got to be real careful i've been trying to guide people to jesus christ and jesus christ alone because they talk about talking to angels or talking to people past but uh, does the Lord allow them to understand what we're going through here i know christ intercedes for us daily um, so if you can expound on that a little bit with the knowledge you have on, do people in heaven know what's going on here? Sure. Um, that's a big subject, isn't it? Yeah. I, I, would, <laughs> I would say that, you know, we would all agree. I think that there are counterfeits out there in the world. Okay. There are people who are ghost hunters that some of the new age doctrine has slipped into Christians where people think that they can go and return to and from heaven at will right. or astral projection. 
um, spirit guides, angel guides, all of that is in the, is out there in, in culture and society and everything else. So I would say it this way, the, the, the existence of the counterfeit proves that there is a reality. There is a real, right. You, know, you don't have a, a fake $20 bill, except that there is a real $20 bill exactly. that it's imitating. <clears throat> so, um, a couple of experiences that'll help underline this. And then we'll talk about, well, you know, Hebrews 12, one talks about after listing the hall of faith, after listing all the, the people there and, and many others that were unnamed, he said, seeing that we have such a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight that besets us and press towards the mark of the high call of God in Christ. Let's press towards the mark. Um, the cloud of witnesses, that is a terminology in that day used of a sporting event of an arena in which spectators are in a stadium looking at the events on a field. So that Hebrews 12, one where it says that we have a cloud of witnesses, you know, we think of it as a cloud of witnesses, but the actual terminology is like one being on the field and you've got a cloud of witnesses around you talking about the people in the stands. Spectators. Yeah. Um, I had an experience that, that helped me a little bit. Um, one of the things that I saw in heaven was a little girl seated um, at the base of a tree and uh, she was sitting, you know, her legs were crossed and she had uh, her back against the tree and there were relatives all around 14 total. And she and her little brother who I understood to be her little brother was crawling all over her lap mm -hmm. and just around, you know, like one that not quite on the, not quite able to, to walk, but just kind of on the edge, you know, a little toddler kind of, you know, crawling around like a bear, you know, the way they do partly <laughs> on their feet and partly. Right. And, and as we walked by as the angel, as my angel and I walked by, I, I noted, I just, I just knew, I looked at the people and I could tell these were aunts and uncles and grandparents and great grandparents and, you know, extended relatives. And I asked the angel, I said, so where are her, where are their parents? Where, you know, where are the parents? And he said, these children died in a car wreck and their parents are still on the earth. Wow. And he said, and he said, when possible, children are raised by relatives in heaven. And I said, I need chapter and verse on that. Yeah. And he said, have you not read in Ephesians 3, 14, where Paul wrote that I bow my knees before the father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. He wow. says there is but one family in heaven and earth, one family. Wow. And so from their perspective, it doesn't matter. So the fact that those relatives knew those children and how they died and they were related, that is a given. That That is certainly the case. Mm -hmm. um, the degree to which they know is not revealed to us. But there have been many, many people, uh, ourselves included, who people will get uh, a sense at big events, weddings um, in particular, I, I hear a lot, family reunions, uh, birthday celebrations, big family events. I, I've had so many people tell me, you know, I felt like, you know, my mom and dad were watching us. You know, there's just this awareness right. and it happened with our, with us, with our youngest son uh, when he got married and, and my wife, Barb, said, you know, I, I could just sense my parents are here watching, yeah. um, you know, from heaven. Right. And the fact that Moses and Elijah appeared to Jesus in Luke chapter 9 and talked to him out of the law and the prophets about his death, which would happen in Jerusalem. They certainly knew what was going on on earth yeah, they because they came down to the Mount of Transfiguration to talk to Jesus from Scripture, right. you know, the law and, and prophecy about his death, which he would accomplish. And so the, we're given that kind of information, uh, even the book of Revelation. Mm -hmm. In chapter, I think it's six, maybe chapter five, but I think it's chapter six, you've got multitudes before the throne. And and they are there saying to the Father God, how long, O God, before you avenge us of our deaths? How long will you hold back your wrath? And he right. says it was told to them to be patient, and right. they were given white robes of righteousness. So they were very much aware of how they died, very much aware of what was going on on earth. So there are several instances there that in Scripture that we see clearly that, if not the full time, at least in part, they know what's going on.
Right. And uh, because there is just one family in heaven and earth. So that's it's, beautiful. yeah, so that's pretty interesting. Yeah. And then, you know, um, I don't know if they, I, I, don't, I haven't found anything in scripture that says that they pray for us, but I know Jesus does. You know, I know he yeah. intercedes for us. So, I, I, I did have one experience I'd, I'd be willing to share. I don't share sure. it. Yeah. I, I can't remember ever sharing it because it's never come up. Okay. But I was I was um I was at a church in Tennessee mm -hmm. uh, ministering a standard church, small kind of a country church. And there was a young man there, probably in his early 30s or so. And um and I just had a word for, for him. You know, I had I was getting words of knowledge and, and prophecy and stuff for different people. Uh that's part of what happens sometimes when I, I minister. And I saw this young man and then I saw the Lord. It was like in a, a picture, like a window. Yeah. And the Lord was standing there and there was a woman standing next to him that I knew just by the spirit that this she was this young man's grandmother. And the Lord, and so I'm I'm talking to this young man and I said, you know, you've had a grandmother who who prayed for you. Anyway, what the Lord told me is this. He said, he said, she, she didn't say a word to me. It was just the Lord. Right. And he said, and, and then he, then he spoke, he, he broke the silence. He said, this is his grandmother. While she was on the earth, she was faithful to pray for him. Wow. And I promised that, that, uh, that, you know, he would be okay, mm -hmm. but now she's in heaven before me. Yeah. And he said, she's a reminder of my faithfulness to him. Mm -hmm. It was pretty interesting. He never indicated she prayed, yeah. but it indicated that as an intercessor, she was here on the earth and now she's in heaven. <laughs> and it was kind of like, okay, now she's in my face. <laughs> but, but he didn't actually say, he didn't actually say that she prayed. Wow. It was just that her faithfulness on earth carried over yeah. into how he viewed this young man and that his faithfulness was continuing. Yeah. His faithfulness to her, even though she was in heaven, he was yeah. still being faithful to her and her prayers for him while he was on the earth. Honoring those prayers. Well, this young man was just it was just so really touched and really gave his heart yeah. fully to the Lord in that. And he acknowledged that his grandmother was always like his not best buddy, his his confidant, you know, and and very close. And he was very heartbroken when she she died and mm -hmm. uh, that she had prayed for him and she was there to support him and everything. And so he got that understanding that, okay, mom's now with the Lord. And, <laughs> she's, and, and I don't know if he thought that she's bugging him or whatever, because that, it, <laughs> well, it was I'll really, it, it, it wasn't that she was praying for him. It was that, that again, the Lord in his mind, the transition from heaven to earth is irrelevant. Right. Because once you're in Christ, you're in Christ. It doesn't matter. It's one family. You know, yeah. heaven or earth, it doesn't matter. But the fact that she was there standing next to the Lord yeah. and he was continuing to be faithful to her prayers on earth and uh, and had not forgotten her grandson. That's, that means a lot to me. And I'll tell you why. Um, I raised one of my grandsons. I have two grandsons. And I raised the younger one while his mom was busy and doing things. I had him from three and a half months to almost five. And mm -hmm. then they moved to another place and we don't get to see each other. And he cries and I cry. I feel like it's my child in a sense, you know? Yeah. So um, he has a heart for the Lord and he's a seer. And he, uh, the last time I saw him, he's like, there's things in this house that are trying to get me to see evil. I said, well, let's practice saying the name of Jesus. I said, when they come around, you say the name of Jesus. So I'm, I'm praying now that the Lord not only restore a better time, that, you know, relationship to, to have with him, but to continue to hold him. So now I'm praying with a friend um, in December over missing him. She said, the Lord told me to tell you that he will hear his voice above all others. Mm -hmm. Then February comes and my daughter lets him stay over. And he says, grandma, I got to tell you something that happened when I lived here. And I said, what? So this is before December. Yeah. He said, I saw an angel of the Lord. I said, unless it, he goes, unless it was Jesus. I said, you would have known if it was Jesus. It was probably an angel. And he said, yeah. I said, well, what did he say? He said, I was to listen to God's voice and nobody else's. I was like, what? So my friend said it in That's December. Cool. He heard it before, but told me in February. So now I'm, uh, you know, I said to the Lord, what do you want me to do with this? And I just I feel this need to continue to pray I cover him. And um, teach him when I can, you know, and so the, the fact that this grandma <laughs> and the Lord honors it even after we're gone, that means a lot to me. I'll be 
I'll be knocking on him <laughs> all, all the time. Twenty. I wake up at three in the morning, start praying for that little one. Yeah, yeah, so he's I five understand. now. Yeah. So that that story the Lord had you share, I think, just for me. <laughs> cool. Praise God. So um, so that's exciting. Now, um, so we're going through like a lot of people think we're in the end times. I think we're in the beginning of the perilous times. Um, I don't think we're at the end of the end. I don't know how you feel about that. But um, a lot of people are trying to, um, uh, like I heard one guy say, Armageddon, Armageddon out of here. And he used to say it as a <laughs> joke, right? <laughs> one of my friends, uh, prophet friends. And uh, But a lot of people are looking for an exit. They're looking for uh, Christ is going to now pull us out, you know. Now, I know the wrath of God is not for us. That's in the first Thessalonians, I think, in five. Um, I forget five, nine. Five, 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 well, nine. one, one, nine and five as well. Yeah. Yeah. So so the word that wrath is not for us. So when it comes to the true great tribulation, tribulation has been around forever, but the true wrath coming, we'll, we will be gone. But um. You know, people need to understand a couple of things. One, they need to stay in the fight. And two, um, I, some people say rapture is not in the Bible. I said, well, the word harpazo was used. But you have a teaching that just blew me away when I saw it that teaches people that the, the taking away or the rapture or harpazo was actually part of the Jewish belief. And it's in the Old Testament. Right. And so I was wondering if you can expound on that a little. I kind of dropped wanting you to talk <laughs> about that on you last minute, but <laughs> but I was so like, uh, oh yeah, I want him to, you know, uh, talk about sure. that. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, you know, a lot of people think that that came around at the end of the 19th century or something. The argument between Schofield or Dakes or right. whatever the case is. Right. Um, my heart, you know, I love. Uh, to teach. I love to, to research. I, I want to find the reason behind the reason. I uh, The first rule of Bible interpretation is to put the speaker back in the context, right? because whatever they say has to make sense to the original readers or listeners. Yeah. And then by, by extraction, it, you know, it, it pertains to us. It's smart. Um, <clears throat> yeah. You know, I do zoom online meetings uh, every other month or so like that. And when people go to our website, cwowi.org they can sign up for my weekly thoughts and my monthly newsletter that's where we put the information about those and i have actually covered this with like a seven page or whatever handout um you know about some of these things um basically if everybody will just kind of throw out or set on the shelf right now what they think they know and just pretend that they're a Jewish person for a minute who doesn't know anything about those those Gentiles. Right. <laughs> the, the, in Leviticus 23, it's the Feast of Trumpets. Mm -hmm. And that also coincides with uh, what became the main celebration now. It's called Rosh Hashanah. Mm -hmm. It means head of the year. Rosh Hashanah means head of the year. It is the, like a lot of ancient cultures, in the fall, and it marks the beginning of the new year. And uh, in the springtime is one new year, the ceremonial new year, where you have Passover, unleavened bread, et cetera. But in the fall, it's agriculture. You know, in other words, the harvest time's done and, and go from there. So Rosh Hashanah is, is the Jews teach that this is the day that the earth was created, Tishri 1, the very first day of Rosh Hashanah. Um, the Feast of Trumpets in, is what the Bible actually calls it. But it's Rosh Hashanah, the head of the year, as as well. Um, the I, I was going to say, I, did I print off some notes here on some of the things here? Um, the word in Hebrew is called Natsal, N-A-T-Z-A-L. And it means the awakening blast. Hmm. In fact, I wrote down uh, it, 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 a lot of, I don't know how much people know, but there's the Bible. And then in Judaism, for instance, there is uh, the Talmud. And the Talmud is consists of two parts. One is the oral law called the Mishnah. And then one is the interpretation and the commentary, which is called the Gemara. And so the Talmud is where we get the details of how they actually celebrated the feast that God gave them, the Feast of Trumpets in particular. 
So there's a lot of stuff written by the rabbis down through the centuries about how they celebrated it, what the meanings of everything were, and, and the way they lived. So in the Talmud, they, they have books on that are called Rosh Hashanah. And you go to chapter 16, and you go to 16a, 16b, in the details there, and they talk about the Natsal. And they talk about how the Feast of Trumpets is called an awakening blast. It is always associated with awakening the righteous dead. Mm -hmm. And in Judaism, they believed, and they believe uh, in, in the strict Orthodox, that there will come a teruah, which is a, an, op uh, an awakening blast, right. where the dead in Messiah will rise and meet Messiah in the air and, and undergo, number one, their judgment, mm -hmm. and number two, following that, a celebration of a wedding feast that will go on for seven years. Wow. That's Judaism, Jody. That's not Christianity. That's Judaism. And so <clears throat> Teruah, uh, you know, I'm going from some of these notes here. Um, there's so much to get into, but Paul is teaching from this understanding. He was well-educated in Judaism, obviously. And so in Judaism, you have, you say, okay, where does this awakening blast come from? Where, how is it blown? What, you know, the Feast of Trumpets, they don't realize that it's to awaken the righteous dead. Well, they had they have three great shofars in Judaism. The great shofar is blown only at Yom Kippur when the city gates are closed and everyone on the inside will have their sins atoned for one year. And they blow that great shofar to, to signify the closing of the city gates and anybody on the inside will have their sins forgiven. And then there is the 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 last what they call the last trumpet or the last shofar the last trumpet, and again they teach that when Abraham sacrificed Isaac and was stopped by the Lord, and there was a ram caught in the thicket, Abraham offered that ram in place of his son, right. and there were two horns involved, uh, the first trump and the last trump, the left and the right. The right hand horn of that ram that was sacrificed right. at the as a picture of resurrection of Isaac being raised from the dead, right. that last trumpet is what is blown at the feast of trumpets mm -hmm. to signify the resurrection from the dead, the the rising of the righteous dead. Wow. That's all Judaism. Mm -hmm. huh. So so Paul carries that over in First Corinthians fifteen, and when he says, you know, I'm, I'm showing you a mystery, we won't all die, but we will all be changed in a moment, in the blinking of an eye, mm -hmm. when the last trumpet sounds, we will all be changed. Wow. What Paul brought in terms of new knowledge was that those who are alive will be changed along with the righteous dead being raised. Right. The righteous dead being raised was just Judaism. Right. Wow. But what he brought to the table was his own personal revelation. He said, I'm going to reveal a mystery to you. I'm going to reveal something that I know. It is that we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in, in, in the Lord. So Paul mentions this a couple different times. When you read Ephesians chapter five, for instance, let me see if I can grab my Bible here. I think it's verse, I think it's uh, 14, 514, maybe. Paul actually paraphrases it and this is what's fun jody is that people don't realize that they're reading about the rapture what we call the rapture right. um without without understanding what's actually being read they, they right. say oh you know people who they may not even believe it uh it's it's ephesians and it's uh the chapter what did i say five all right yeah did you say 14? that's not right yeah oh chapter five duh john turn to the right chapter <laughs> Yeah, it's it's chapter five and verse fourteen. Okay, I see it here. Okay, so Paul writes and he says, "Oh, he says this in in verse thirteen uh, or verse fourteen. He says, therefore he says, awake you who sleep, rise from the dead. Christ will give you light. So then walk cautiously, circumspectly, as not as fools, but as wise. Mm -hmm. Well, we don't realize the reason in a lot of Bibles that's in a smaller font and and." Mm -hmm put in there is because that was the temple prayer. That's a paraphrase of the temple prayer prayed during the feast of trumpets. It is a direct reference to the, to the nuts all to the ca catching away of the believers. And so the, the, he that he's saying, therefore he says the he that he's talking about is the priest in the temple. Wow. Therefore he says, and notice what he says, 
Awake, you who sleep. That that's that's New Testament, Old Testament terms for die right. or for death. Awake, you who are dead. Rise from the dead. Christ will give you light. That's straight out of the temple prayer for for the nuts all for the feast of trumpets starred in my bible here yeah yeah it's amazing yeah. um the other the other place and here's the other amazing thing is that the feast of trumpets is the only one of the seven festivals that god gives that starts on the new moon mm. the other six are all during the full moon when the moon is bright and can be seen right and it, this is the only one that starts at the new moon when when there is no moon it's we, we'd say wow it's a dark night yeah there's no moon it's the new moon Huh. It's hidden in the shadows. And the reason the Feast of Trumpets, it begins at uh, um, at the new moon is because in Judaism, from the first day of creation, that the earth stands for believers because mm -hmm. they recognize the earth doesn't have its own light. It derives its light from the sun mm -hmm. and it was designed to rule the night. Mm -hmm. And so in Judaism, the moon has always stood for believers. So when that that the teruah, when the trumpet is blown and the dead in Christ rise, and then Paul adds his own revelation that those who are alive uh, will be caught away, uh, that happens at the new moon, and, and it's a symbol of being hidden away in Christ. Paul alludes to this in Colossians chapter 2, verses 14 through 16. And he talks about the work of Christ on the on the cross, how he nailed the offenses. To, you know, to the cross, taking it out of the way, how he spoiled principalities and powers and made a show of them openly. He says, therefore, don't let anybody judge you on Sabbath days or holy days or the new moon, which is a shadow of something to come. Right there in, in Colossians 2, verse 16 and 17, or 14 through 17, if you want to look at that whole context. Yeah. He says, the new moon is a shadow of something to come. So there Paul is alluding to the Jewish belief that there, belief that there is this not Saul, this catching away. Wow. And of course, when you understand that, then First and Second Thessalonians make perfect sense. As you said, as you said, we're not destined to the day of wrath. Right. The day, the day of wrath, is a very Jewish terminology that means the tribulation, what we call the time of tribulation, what they call the time of Jacob's trouble. Right. Um, the when you read in Second Thessalonians, and and Paul is writing it. Well, the First Thessalonians, he told them, he said, he said, I've told you before what's going to happen. The Lord will descend with a shout and with the the trumpet of God, and we will be up and, and caught up with him, uh, you know, in the air. He writes his second letter to provide some of the details. Right. And he says, he who is restraining Antichrist will remain until he is taken out of the way. Mm, yeah. And he talks about the departure that has to come first. The departure in Paul's time did not mean a falling away from the faith. And, and shame on some of the Bible paraphrasers who put, who add from the faith. Right. into the word departure it actually it was actually started in paul's day to describe the process of a ship sailing over the horizon and falling out of view going out on a departure so it became known it became uh, as a as a departure um kenneth wiest who has a wiest new testament and and commentary kenneth wiest brings out the fact that 11 out of 15 times of memory serves that word is used in in Acts. It does not talk about a falling away from the faith or rebellion. It right. talks about a departure. It's literally a departure. And that's the only way Second Thessalonians makes sense, Jody. Yeah. That, that the departure comes first. And then he who has because he who has been restraining Antichrist will be removed. Right. And then Antichrist can be revealed. That's the only way that makes sense. If you if you think it's falling away from the faith, yeah. then you're left with thinking that falling away from the faith is the thing that is restraining Antichrist. I think, yeah, that doesn't make sense. It's not grammatical. Yeah. Sense. So anyway, that's it in a nutshell. Yeah. Um, I do have lots of teachings. I have quite a few yeah. teachings on our website oh, about it. Yeah, people should go because I know you go through, I think it's Isaiah uh, tw 26 and what was it, 15? 57 53 where you actually bring in scriptures that continue to talk about this taking away of yeah. you know and then when you said um you know paul said we would be caught up together because we now through christ are part of that family so i guess the jews saw it as the faithful jews would be taken away yes. but we're grafted in so that means we would be caught up Together. That's right. Um, That's right. Yeah. And 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 it's interesting that you know Malachi refers to the book of remembrance that is opened. Mm -hmm. And in Judaism, they teach that at 
at Rosh Hashanah the, d- during the Feast of Trumpets that the books are opened. And and you can look it up online. You, what happens during the, the next seven years after the Natsal, after the, the, the awakening blast, right. is what they teach is that in God's mind, the books are open and the earth is divided into three groups of people in God's mind. Right. The completely wicked, the completely righteous who have been ca- carried away. Mm-hmm. And the largest group is called the intermediates. Mm-hmm. And any of your listeners can can research intermediates in ju- in Judaism. Right. And, and it'll provide the information that, about the, what I'm telling you. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's common. I don't say it's common knowledge. You have to research it. But I'm just telling you it's out there. Yeah. So in God's mind, the tribulation in the last seven years is is to get the intermediates, the undecided ones, to receive Jesus as, as Messiah. Mm-hmm. And because he doesn't infringe on free will, and he gave us the earth, right? but he is also, at the same time, he has retained his authority as the creator. Right. right. Okay. So that's why you see nature going crazy during the last seven years, a double asteroid hit, the yeah. big dust cloud that comes up and poisons people for five months or something like that and causes skin sores. Yeah. You see the, the waters being poisoned, the different things happen. And it's because he retains his right as the creator mm-hmm. uh, in the hopes that, that people will come to him. Yeah. And uh, anyway, that's what that seven years is about. Yeah, that's amazing. And that intermediate group are people who, who just have not like you said, devoted themselves to the Lord. So if there's no great falling away of believers, which I rejoice in the Lord that there will not be, but we have this harvest that we're promised, you know, uh, so that is where that harvest is going to come from. And uh, I've talked to the Lord about that. I said, those who are incorrigible to serve evil, you know, you said, suffer not a witch to live. You, you're, he said, be hot or cold or I'll spit you out, you know, and I think we're coming to a time and maybe you can help um, me. This is ad hoc. So (laughs) um, I believe we're coming to that time where it says, um, and maybe I've got it wrong, but the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence and the violent take it by force. I believe we are coming to a time where we need to understand our authority in Jesus Christ. We need to walk in the fullness of that understanding, like the centurion, who said, as a Marine veteran, I can say I understand authority. I know when someone I obeyed my last order first, you know, and you do what you're told, you know. So um, as far as the Lord, you know, he gave us this authority in his name, the name above all names, no rival, no equal, as the song says, you know, it just blows me away. So the incorrigible will remain incorrigible. Those of us who are immersed pickled i'm pickled in the lord (laughs) um we will remain pickled so you know just drenched and and then if we walk in our authority and we know how to bind up and that's something i'd love to have you back on where we could talk about uh the demonic spirits the nephilim as you might understand it the ufo uh delusion that may be coming that's something we could do another time if you're interested i'd love to have you on for that because i love your wisdom um, but that little group right there, we need to fight this end time. It feels like like portals have been opened and there's you can feel the presence of darkness. But those that intermediate group need Jesus and we need to not cower back. You know, I have so many people and there's times I've felt it where you just feel like oh, I am tired. <laughs> yeah. I'm tired of fighting witches and Satanists and demons and, you know. But we can't be tired. We have to fight back in his name and authority to get that intermediate group. You know, we want heaven full with just, you know, the the people who God loves so much. But anyway, but what's your thought on that? (laughs) Well, you 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 were kind of hitting all over the Yeah, I know. Sorry. Buckshot. (laughs) If if I could break some things down. Um number one, people let's talk about just being standing up for who we are in Christ. Let's go from that basis. Mm -hmm. And I will say this, number one, neither God nor the devil can make you do anything. Mm -hmm. People have to understand your will is sovereign. That's the only way to have a fair judgment before God, a fair accounting of our lives is if it is totally on us. So and, and what I tell people is this, your free will is stronger than the devil. 
Yes. You really don't need the Lord to stand against the devil in, in a lot of areas. Mm -hmm. For instance, millions of people all over the world without Christ stop being alcoholics every mm -hmm. single year. Mm -hmm. They stop chain smoking. They, they stop cursing. They stop going on drugs and, and binges. They stop sleeping around. They control themselves all by their free will. Right. So many Christians have lost that. They just want to, you know, get, get behind it and say, oh, devil, you know, get away from me, get away from me. And it's like, no, no, no. Stand, grow a backbone, stand up and realize that you are your own person. Neither God nor the devil can make your mind up for you. Amen. You know, God can't force you to be saved, can't force you to serve him. Mm -hmm. And neither can the devil do that. Right. So that's number one. Number two, we've been given the armor of God, and more importantly, the, along with that, that ties it all together, mm -hmm. is we've been given the authority to use the name of Jesus, Amen. which is the most powerful name in the universe. So many times I get people say, I need deliverance, or I'm depressed, or I'm whatever, help me out. And I say, would you study the name of Jesus, the faith in the name of Jesus? Mm -hmm. um, this hit me as a teenager in Matthew, or excuse me, Acts 3.16. When Peter is called before the authorities and this lame man had been totally healed and they want to know by what authority does this man stand before you whole? And Peter said this, through faith in the name of Jesus, this man stands before you whole. If Christians would, number one, realize their will is sovereign, the devil can't make you do anything. So stop being afraid of him. Stop being intimidated. Stop being scared. Don't worry about him. He can't do anything to you. If you are in Christ, nothing can separate you. Nothing can touch you. Right. And so grow a backbone and just say, devil can't touch me. Can't, devil can't hurt me. No. Not only that, I've got my spirit recreated by the Holy Spirit, and I've got the authority to use the name of Jesus. And you just tell that demon, you know, to get lost, yeah. Yeah. to get out of here in the name of Jesus. The real issue, Jody, is that Christians aren't willing to come to grips with the fact that they want to sin. Yeah. It, it doesn't matter. It, it, porn, alcohol, mm -hmm. chain smoking, sleeping around, right. financial mismanagement, disciplining themselves with their finances, whatever the case is that the Lord is working on them, they don't want to really deal with it. They right. just want the temptation to go away. And it's like, that's not how it works. Right, right. You know, Jesus didn't magically make the devil stop tempting him. Mm -hmm. He had to resist. He had to exert himself. He had to state himself, the scripture. He had to, he had to lay the boundaries for what for where Satan could not cross. Amen. And in doing so, the devil backed off. Oh, yeah. yeah. So that's that's number one, is to not be afraid, but to realize that the devil can't make you do anything. Mm -hmm. And you've got the Holy Spirit. You've got the power of the name of Jesus. So command, not, not pray. Jesus never prayed. Not a single prayer against the devil can be found right. in the Gospels or the book of Acts. Right. They commanded. And so just obey Jesus in command. That's right. The, the other element about that is that, um, you know, then you look at the dark side, you know, Matthew 24, Jesus said that because the love of many will turn cold, mm -hmm. iniquity right. will increase. Yeah. So you're absolutely correct that all around us, the world is getting darker and darker. Mm -hmm. All the more reason for Christians to stand up and to say, you know, here's how I'm living my life. And people will see the father's provision. They will see the grace. They will see the timing. They will see the peace. You know, in one of our, one of our house churches, we had this uh, couple guys who worked together in this, um, the one, the one's married and had four kids. One of his coworkers came over and he said, he said, how are you so calm? How are you so calm? And this is just a coworker just down the hallway, you know, and he started sharing about the Lord. And the guy said, I don't, he said, I'm not going to church. I'm not a Bible banger. So I don't want anything to do with that. And, and he said, well, he said, that's not really what it's about at all. He said, why don't you come over with your, your uh, wife and three kids and come on over. Your kids can play with our kids. We'll have some spaghetti. And so they started talking. Wow. And this was a couple who had lived together and had three kids. Uh, had never given a thought of marriage because they didn't want anything to do with God or anything else. Right. But they observed this man's life. They observed, they got to know this man and woman and their family and what they stood for, the boundaries that they had and the joy and the peace. And they said, I want that. Mm -hmm. And in a very short order, they were born again, baptized with the Holy Spirit. Um, that couple actually babysat their kids while they went on a honeymoon cruise because they got married and went on a honeymoon cruise, oh. became part of that house church. 
Wow. So that's the kind of light, you know, where people are watching us, Jody. People are looking at us, mm -hmm. you know, and they're looking for why do we have peace? Why do we have joy in the midst of all this? Right. And that's the element of our faith that has to be supernatural, has to be alive, not right. just chapter and verse, which can be as dry as toast, but right. there's got to be this vitality yes, about our, our walk with the Lord. And that's what we're what's what people are looking for. They're looking for life. Yeah. Um and you said you said something about light, and that word was kidnapped by the uh, New Agers. <laughs> but the Bible says we are a, 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 a you know a beacon of light, a, a city set on a hill that cannot be hid. He also called us children of light. Jesus in us shines bright. I've had people come up and say there's something different about you, and I've been able to witness. I've also had pro prophetic people come up and say Satan knows your name, and I said that's okay because my father knows my name too. Yeah, you know, yeah. so it's okay. I don't mind he knows my name because he better get out of the way because I'm not afraid of him. You know, yeah. so um, I know that who is in me, and that's what we want to instill in these folks. You know, but what? Yeah, what well, if? Um... There was a, a visitation I had with the Lord where he was teaching me about, about demons and the way they operate. Yeah. And we were in the spirit and we were looking at a man mm -hmm. and out from him in the spirit was a sphere of light. This man just exuded light. Mm -hmm. And the Lord and I were standing like outside of that. And we were actually, it was dark everywhere else. And this man was just standing there. The, Jesus was teaching me as he's giving me this example. Right. So the Lord and I are there along the outside. And going all around this sphere of light around this man were two little demons um, looking for an opening to get into this ball yeah. of light. So, you know, the, the new agers say, oh, you've got an aura right, or something like that. And what they're picking up on is the counterfeit of the real. And the real is, as Ephesians 5, 8 says, and 9, you were before times darkness, but now are you light? Mm -hmm. And what, he's, what, uh, what Gabriel said in uh, Daniel... Uh, 12 one or michael and said that you know those that believe in the lord will shine brighter and brighter yeah. as, yeah. as the noonday sun yeah. and so and so anyway so these demons were there looking for an opening and the lord and i were just and the demons were, never looked behind us because they would have been terrified and run away yeah if they us, but it was it was a teaching moment for the lord so uh, so we're standing there just watching this man is there in the middle of this ball of light the sphere of light there's no floor i mean it's a complete sphere you yeah. know it didn't end at the it wasn't a hemisphere. It wasn't a half. Right. It didn't end at the floor. He was just there. Right. And these demons. And then I saw this man thinking about a sin. <clears throat> and the Lord was teaching me about how he, about every two weeks, he falls back into this sin. Yeah. And when he was thinking about it, and I saw this, this sphere of light. And and just as he was thinking about that, this, this wedge, like a pie shaped from him in the middle outward to where, you know, where we were out there. Yeah. And these demons saw that opening and they walked in and they didn't want to touch the light. And when it got more narrow, they actually turned sideways. Oh, wow. now, these, now these little demons are about two or three feet tall, you know, yeah. no more than a meter oh, or three feet. Yeah. And, um, and uh, the, just when they fell from heaven, you know, they're, it, it's like a, sometimes you look at a person in the, in the depth of sin and the world, and they are just shriveled like a raisin, yeah. you know, they're, they, they, and if you were to see a picture of them in their teenage years or 20 years, the, it would be hugely different. Yeah. Well, imagine beings who were with the Father God before the creation, yeah. and they've had all that righteousness stripped away. They're just a shell of their former selves. Mm -hmm. Very, most of them are afraid. I've, I've seen some big ones too. Yeah. Um, I saw a big demon look like Jabba the Hutt kind of in a, <laughs> in a church, and it was a big, it was a big lazy, gluttonous yeah. spirit. Uh -huh that was in a church and it, it was a church that was all about the prosperity and it was a me, me, me gospel. But anyway, most demons, the hassle people are smaller. Mm -hmm. So these demons go into this wedge and then at the last second, they just, they, they made a hop and jumped up on the guy's shoulders and started talking to him mm -hmm. and he sinned whatever the sin was and then repented, you know, confessed his sin, et cetera. And those demons got off of there and that, that light closed again. Wow. So now he's protected. So mm -hmm. if people realize that we are light and, you know, in Ephesians four, it talks about being the children of wrath, how we were before times children of wrath, right. because it was our nature right. who by nature were children of wrath. Mm -hmm. Well, that tells us that sinners sin because it's their nature, mm -hmm. but Christians sin by choice. 
Right. That's scary. And so, and, and we're all, none of us is perfect. Trust me. We're right. all, we're all imperfect. You know, Yeah. first, first John one seven says, you know, if you, if, if somebody says they don't have sin, that they're a liar. Right. Right. So, but and then right above that, first John one five, God is light and in him, there's no darkness. So yep. being children are light. We are his children, you know? So yeah. And yeah. people don't understand the difference between relationship and fellowship. Right. You know, you know, I, I, I'm the oldest of four kids. And if I hit my little brother and got sent to my room, <laughs> you know, I wasn't kicked out of the family. I just had broken fellowship with my right. brother <laughs> and uh, my mom yeah. until I apologized. Right. But there was never any thought about kicking you out of the family. Right, right. Um, Paul, you know, Paul told in first Corinthians chapter three, uh, verse, especially three through 15, but the whole the whole chapter one through 15, right. first Corinthians three, he talked about people who were in envy, strife and divisions. You know, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos. Right. I don't want any of them. And he said, he said, this is wood, hay and stubble. And if you carry it to your death, huh. it's going to get burned away like fire and you will be saved, mm -hmm. but you're going to be like somebody who came through the fire and lost everything. Right. Wow. And so there are Christians out there who will carry sin into their death, having never dealt with it and yeah. they will get saved. Yeah. Because they're believers, their yeah. relationship is is secure because they're they are walking with the Lord, yeah. but that other stuff will get burned away. Yeah, so. and that, that's something. Uh, I was talking to somebody the other day that and they asked me to pray with them, and we were, I was talking to them about organic decisions. In other words, uh, sometimes we want God to help us because we don't want to help ourselves, so we're like, "Help me out of this." But we have to make an organic decision from our own spirit. I do not want this, and that's, that's not me. Yeah. And yeah, it's like, I don't, I want God. I want all God. And, um, and so some, you know, uh, when I pray with people, I want them to understand that. And then we can ask father, you know, father, I'm not sure about whether this is right or wrong. It's not a sin, but whether I should move on this or not. And then I say, well, let's just ask him father, direct my path, light my way. It's, it, it isn't as hard as we make it sometimes, right. you know? That's right. So, um, but go ahead. You were going to say something. Well, I was going to say one, one thing too, that can, will help. I think people too, there was a change that came in my life, you know, decades ago mm -hmm. where I recognized that when I sinned, I hated the sin. I hated the grievance I feel in my spirit. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And, and it's almost like a bruise, yeah. you know, because it doesn't go away. You say, please forgive me, but there's still that lingering hurt, that, that grievance, that, heaviness, that damage in your spirit. Right. And so it's like a bruise. And in theologi theologically, I know I'm forgiven, but on the inside, I still feel that, mm -hmm. that condemnation, that guilt, that conviction, conviction right. would be the better word. Mm -hmm. Conviction brings us towards God. It's all about God. Condemnation is about us right. and it pulls us away. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, so I came to the point where I realized that I loved the fellowship with the Lord more than I loved the pleasure of sin. Mm -hmm. And so on that basis, it became a matter of why should I do that mm -hmm. and feel that grievance that I hate so much? Right. Um, why should I do that? Because I, And so I became, you know, protective, became protective of that righteousness in me. I want to protect that, that warmth, that presence that I feel in me 24 yeah. seven. And I don't like grieving it. I don't like that suppression. I don't like that, that bruising, that hurt. And yeah. so I began looking at things of why should I leave what I'm doing? Why should I leave this peace and this joy and this wholeness yeah. to do that? I hate that grievance. I hate, I hate yeah. that, that sense. Yeah. And when I just made that shift of why should I do that? Why should I give up what I've got? Right. Then the temptations just fell by the wayside. It's like, there's nothing you can tempt me with that right. would be strong enough to overcome my desire to be righteous and to feel that 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 presence in my spirit. So yeah, that's beautiful. if yeah. you shift that and and then something that happened to me one day in, in back in the 80s when I was driving and and thanking the father for first John 1 9, thanking him, it says if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Mm -hmm. Which means if you confess what you know, he cleanses you from all unrighteousness. You confess what you know, he takes care of all the rest so that you you walk away with a clean slate on everything. Yeah. 
Amen. You, Praise and, God. Okay. <laughs> but I was thinking, I was like, thank you, Father, for being faithful to me. It says, if I confess my sin, you're faithful and just to forgive me my sin. Thank you for being faithful to me. Just like that, the Father interrupted me and said, I'm not being faithful to you. I'm being faithful to the work of my son on the cross. Yeah. Wow. And that took all the pressure off of me. There was such a, I, I mean, I literally had this kind of image in my mind that the father would kind of look over to Jesus and say, should we forgive him right now? You know, this is like, <laughs> you know, how many times has he done this? Are you keeping right? track, you know, and flip a coin, let it make him sweat a little bit, you know, I mean, I had this in my <laughs> mind, <a> lesson, yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and when he said, I'm being faithful to the work of my son on the cross, it was just, it's like, wow, that happened Ooh. a couple thousand years ago. Wow. It was already taken care of. Yeah. He's being faithful to to Jesus. It takes me out of the equation. Yeah. There's not the pressure on there, the condemnation and, and everything else. And yeah. and that that was another thing that, that really changed my life. So that's amazing. Hey, there was a time where I was curious about um as a I've been a Christian since I was 11. I'm 60 now. So I've been Christian a long time. And I think I was in my late 20s. And I knew some people that that got involved in witchcraft. So I said, what are they afraid of? Why, why are people afraid of that? I wanted to go see. So I went in and I uh, I made a, it was crazy. The, people were opening Bibles saying, what's this say? And the Lord would quicken my spirit and tell me where it was, you know? And then they'd ask me questions. And then one day I got away from it all. And the Lord, I was driving in a town that had no street lights. It was dark. My little son was like five. He fell asleep and I'm lost. I can't see the roads. It's dark. And the Lord whispered to me, it la I mean, it was loud, even though it was a whisper. He said, your sin stinks in my nostrils and I'm sensitive to smell. So I was, I said, what? And he said, you used my gifts and took credit for them with those people when they would at, they would hand me a ring and say, who owns this ring? Or, <clears throat> you know, they were kind of pushing to see the God in me almost so performing God rather than, yeah, yeah. you know, so I got in trouble for it with the Lord. I well, I hate to say it this way, but I snot cried <laughs> for I don't know how long. I'm sorry, Father, I hurt you. I hurt you. I, I I could not. I was lost. I didn't know where I was. And then I don't even know how long we were at that, but I was crying so heavy. And then finally, I felt his spirit lift, that heaviness. He forgave me and I, I could cry talking about it. But there was something. And then I saw a light and I went down and I was on the main road in town. <laughs> figure that out. He kept me in the dark until, until he forgave me. Amazing. When I came out of that, there was a desire never to hurt him like that again. Yep. I don't ever want to hurt. I don't just the thought of it still. And have I done stupid things since? Yeah. And he said to like, yep. Joe, Joe. Yeah. <laughs> but now, and, and, you know, here I am at 60 and it's like, nothing means anything to me, but to please him. Yep. And, uh, and like you said, the temptations that you just go get out of here with that, you know? So, um, yeah. So, and I pray, I constantly pray, don't allow me to say this prayer, Lord, lead me not to temptation. Let me see what the enemy's planning. Cause if I see the enemy behind the person trying to mess with me, I'll walk away, you know? So but the, the, there's a phrase that I have said to myself for decades. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know where I heard it. I, you know, that's lost on me, but it goes back to my teens, probably in twenties. Mm -hmm. And it is that, that it's just been my heart. And that is race to the judgment, run to the light. Wow. It's out of the first chapter of John, where he says that he who, uh, does evil doesn't want to come to the light, lest their deeds be exposed. Right. But he that does righteousness comes to the light so that things can be revealed for what they really, what they are. Yeah. And so race to the judgment, run to the light has always been my heart's desire, <clears throat> along with Psalm 103.7. Yeah. Psalm 103.7 says, he made way, he made known his ways to Moses, his acts, A-C-T-S, yeah. to the children of Israel. And early on, I recognized, I don't want to be like the children of Israel who yeah. had to have water out of the rock and right. complained every step of the way, you know, yeah. I want to know his ways. I want to be up on the mountain. Yeah. If I know his ways, the acts will come. The actions will come. I want to be like Moses up to know his ways. And yeah. that's, uh, it's exactly. been my heart ever since, you know? Yeah. And I've so apologized that's... to him for the, the actions of people when he shows himself and they just completely ignore him. 
you know. Now we were going to also talk about the armor, and it, and I know I do. Uh, can I keep you for? Oh, uh, sure. Quick, quick? Sure. So so we talked about people in heaven knowing what's going on, and we talked about rapture was an Old Testament thing, and then for where we are today, just um, a, I love yeah, <laughs> I love how you had shared about the armor of God because that's a big one for me. I teach spiritual warfare and the armor of God literally being that we stand in our salvation, which protects our mind, righteousness protects our heart. So I was hoping that you can kind of give an overview of the armor and Christ in us and, and how you brought that forward so that people understand, okay, we are in a season and this is how we protect ourselves, knowing the things that we know, what Paul meant by the armor. Um, if you could just touch on all, you know, and yeah. I'm kind of giving you a big one right here. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, the context of Paul, when he's writing to the Ephesians and mentions the armor of God, it's the only place we really see it in the New Testament. And he lives in a time when Nero is the emperor. And while there are believers, you know, in, in there, I, I forget which letter he's writing to, but he says, I think, oh, it's to the Philippians, I think, at the end of the Philippians, that they, those of Caesar's household greet you, or especially those of Caesar's household. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty amazing. <clears throat> but they lived in dangerous times. And so at that time, um, persecution in the Roman Empire originally was rather sporadic. Here a little, there a little, the Jews would follow Paul around and stir up trouble. And it was becoming more organized. It was building towards just a blanket persecution against Christians. And when Paul's writing that in Ephesians 6, he's actually, he's talking about families. He's talking about dads, don't provoke your children right. to wrath. He's talking about if you're, a, you know, a slave, then serve as unto the Lord, not unto, not with right. eye service. Talking about all these things. He's talking about how to survive in the midst of very evil times. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the context. He after this, he says, pray for me for boldness. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting that we people want to know, is it okay to pray for certain things? Paul asked, pray for me for boldness and for the right and for the opening mm -hmm. to be given so that I can defend the gospel. Mm -hmm. And so right in the middle of that is put on the whole armor of God. So obviously the context is mentally spiritually you need to be prepared because we live in dangerous times mm -hmm. and um and one of the things i bring out is just the 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 uh the grammar of the sentence the armor of god <clears throat> what i reference to is this if i were to say i'm holding the coat of jody mm -hmm. or i'm holding the bible of jody it's understood that that coat or that Bible belonged to you. Right. Belonged to Jody. Mm -hmm. So when Paul writes the armor of God, the first thing to see is that it's God's armor. It's God's that. clothing. Mm -hmm. and so we ask ourselves, do we see a do we see another point where this kind of thing comes up? And the answer is yes, in 1 Samuel 17, mm -hmm. where David is going to confront Goliath and King Saul, who in chapter 9. And about verse two, we're told that he stood head and shoulders taller than anybody else in the whole nation of Israel. King Saul was a giant himself. He was a head and shoulders above everybody else. Not a giant giant, but he was a big man. Yeah. <laughs> head and shoulders, a foot taller than anybody else in the nation of Israel. I think it's, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's first Samuel nine, yeah. one and two. There was a man of the tribe of Benjamin named Kish who had a son named Saul who was goodlier or better. Uh, looking than anybody else and he was head and shoulders above everybody i think that's, that's the passage right. yeah. yeah so he he gives david his armor and he says wear this and david says no 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 he said i can't wear this i haven't proved it yet in battle right. and so david went and took the sling and the five stones um to to prepare to do battle and of course we know why he took the five stones if you look later, you find that Goliath had brothers, had four brothers. So David was ready to take on all five of them. Right. <laughs> but he said, I, he said, this is, you know, this is, I haven't tried your armor. I've got to take what I know. So when we go to the armor of God, that takes us to Isaiah 59 mm -hmm. and verse 15. We say, okay, if we're taking on the armor of God, we don't want to be like David taking on Saul's armor that we haven't tried, that we don't, that doesn't fit us. Right. Mm -hmm that we we have not worn in battle before we're taking the armor of god 
has it been proven? And the answer is in Isaiah 59, starting with verse 15. And it says, truth fails. And the Lord wondered that there was no intercessor. Therefore, he put on, and I, I, I got it down here. Um, he put on, his arm brought salvation. His righteousness sustained him. He put on righteousness as a breastplate, the helmet of salvation upon his head. According to his deeds, they he will according to their deeds he will repay. So the Lord Jesus wow. put on the armor to do in battle where he lived his life and his ministry here on the earth. So when Paul says put on the armor of God, he's talking about putting on Christ, and mm -hmm. because he has been proven in battle, it's not, it's it's not. It's not uh, a uniform. It's not equipment that hasn't been tried and proven. Right. It has been tried in battle and found to be successful. Victorious, yeah. 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 And so and so, Paul said, put on that armor. That, that is a mental well-do. I'm not one who, who you know, sits there and doesn't. Yeah, yeah me either. Yeah. <laughs> type of thing. But I'm aware of the elements of it. Yes. And, and I will bring out this too. He says, his arm brought forth salvation. That's kind of lost on us, but back in, you know, when Isaiah is prophesying this in 700, 750 BC, somewhere in there, the arm represents the strength, uh -huh. you know, and, and we still, I mean, you know how it is. Somebody show their, how strong are you? Let me show right, you right. my and bicep. bicep. <laughs> um, but the Psalms tell us that the heavens are the work of thy fingers. Wow. So all the universe is just his fingers work. Mm -hmm. It's finger painting to God. To bring salvation required all his strength. Wow. And that is why in the in strength, he put on the armor to bring forth our salvation. So that when Paul says, hey, we're well, living in dangerous times and you need to be serious about scripture. You need to be serious about your salvation. You need to be serious about the breastplate of righteousness. You, you need to be serious about all this. He's right. saying it's number one, it's God's armor. Number two, it's been proven in battle. Yeah. Number three, it was his arm that brought forth righteousness, all his strength, all his power, because nobody opposed him to to, to make the universe. The right. fingers are the works of the or the universe are the works of your fingers. Your fingers right. made the universe. Nobody opposed him in that. Right. But his arm had to be used to bring salvation. So you're wearing you're wearing the highest degree of armor you can have. Right. You can't yeah. get any better than that because yeah. it was brought forth by God's power and God's strength to bring us salvation. Amen. Amen. It's amazing. It is amazing. And and I love too, that he also uh, speaks on uh, the armor of light in uh, Romans, I think it's 13 and 12. Yes. Yeah. Um, you know, and so we're surrounded, like you just told us this uh, teaching Jesus had with you about the light that surrounds us. We've got this armor, you know, and I've always tried to teach it exactly like you said, don't, I don't sit and put on a helmet. I say, my salvation keeps my mind and keeps the mind of Christ, you know, righteousness covers my spirit and my heart so that my soul is right. You know, the truth is, a, a you know, the belt and it, everything connects to the belt. So everything about we, what we believe is, is connected to the truth and yeah. Jesus is the truth. So, and, you know, uh, preparation with the gospel of peace, being ready to go and bring the word and spread the gospel and knowing the word of God, you have to be prepared yeah. with you know, and we can go it's on. That, it, it's that mental part of, but you know what, Jared, if I could share. Yes. <laughs> when we're, when we're recording this, this is Wednesday. Every Wednesday I do a teaching on YouTube. Yeah. Um, again, super house church, John Finn, you can, you can find it there. Please, please do. Yeah. And I shared, I shared about today. I shared about something that the Lord had spoken to me about the season that we're in, in the spirit. Okay. And what we are in is a season of judging ourselves. Mm. You know, Peter talked about in first Peter four, uh, 17, that judgment begins at the house of God. Right. Yeah. And, and I brought out the fact that he says it begins at the house, indicating a process. Mm. The Lord's instructions to the seven churches were instructions to clean their act up. Mm. And then he said, he who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the spirit is saying to the churches. That indicates that there is a process of hearing and that some people aren't hearing. But what we're talking about with the armor of God, we're talking about that seriousness, that saying, I'm judging myself, that I want to live for God and and resist the devil. And I will be careful what comes in my eye gate, my ear gate. You know, I will be careful about, about what I allow to, myself to dwell on. 
And it is a process. It is trial and error. Um, Hebrews 5.14, uh, the author writes, and he says, he says, strong meat is for those who by reason of use have trained their senses to discern between good and evil. It's by reason of use, which means it's trial and error. Yeah. It, it means, it means, you know, you're, but it's, but it's a lifelong process and the season we're in right now, it's, it's interesting before COVID hit the, in one of the visitations of Lord visited me during that time, he said, he said, the body of Christ is about to enter into a time of judgment where I'm asking them to judge themselves. Mm. And, and we went through that with the election with COVID and there were people who unfriended people yeah. there, they, they cut them off. If they had a different view on the on the shot, if they had a different view politically, <laughs> yeah. they, they found themselves cutting off people and everything. Those people failed. Mm -hmm. And and like Paul told them in Corinthians, people who held on to prejudice and strife, he said, many are weak and sickly and many have even died early. Yeah. Because you haven't discerned, you've despised the body of Christ, mm -hmm. is what he told them earlier. He said, have you despised the body of Christ? And that was then. But he what he's told me now is over the next two years... 2023, 2024, mm -hmm. especially towards the end of this year, um, in the second half of this year, especially towards the end of this year and the beginning of next, um, has another time for the body of Christ to have an opportunity to judge itself. Mm -hmm. And and what that means is there has to be, you're going to see a separation of people who are serious about God and people who are not. Yeah. You're going to, you're going to see people who will want the status quo, who are ignoring and I'm not saying that you have to build a bunker and spend right. all your paycheck on stuff like that. It's it's talking about emotionally and spiritually and in our relationships, right. be serious and not only be serious, but make things right as much as it lies within you right. to live at peace with all men. Yeah. Because there, there are times there's opportunities coming up where we're going to have that choice again. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in the body of Christ, if you really read the New Testament, in, Mark, in Romans 16, about verses 13, 14, Paul says to mark those who purposely cause divisions mm. among you and avoid them. Right. And he says, don't, um, you can argue a point, but not to the point where it becomes an argument. Right. Or you can debate the point, but not, you know, there's very few scriptures um, about breaking off fellowship with another Christian. Right. Um compared to the way it's used today yeah. you know if there's a major sin you know like paul said in first corinthians 5 he said i told you not to not to you know fellowship with uh, the fornicators and the and the people of the world you know th there's there's that element but in the body of christ itself you know there are very few things where he says this rises to the level where you need to cut them out of your life yeah yeah. In this day and age, it's a click of a button. I don't agree with you. You don't agree with me. I'm going to unfriend you. I'm going to block you. I'm going to remove you from my cell phone database, whatever the case is. That's the type of thing where that's the first part where we start judging ourselves, Jody, is, is those relationships and, and walking through the differences. You know, we do house church network and our, I've been told now by my son, who's our network is now in something like 57 nations. We have house churches from behind mm -hmm. the veil of Islam to, to all over, you know, US, Canada, et cetera. Yeah. And uh, in Asia and different things. And, and the commonality we find is the same things, teaching fellowship, food and prayer yeah. and focusing on Jesus, because that's who we have in common. When we step through the door of somebody's house, you leave your rapture theory, you leave the shape of the earth theory. Yeah. You, if you leave all of that stuff at the door yeah. for the opportunity to grow in Christ, yeah. to learn from Christ in each other, because yeah. we're all living, breathing temples. And that's the kind of seriousness that's coming on the earth. It's already there yeah. in China where they're persecuted. Oh, um, yet one of the I heard one of the house church leaders say they estimate one million Chinese come to the Lord every month. Praise God. And they're all in house churches. Uh, I've got friends in India. You you look all over Asia. It's just amazing what the Lord is doing, and the the church in the U.S. and the West in general are so far behind. Uh, you know, right. because because most pastors, when they say revival is coming, they think it means adding an extra service or building a larger building, and they don't realize if you look over the world, revival is quote unquote revival. It's actually the pouring out of God's spirit is already happening 
and right. that we are so behind the curve. We are. But, uh, but it's amazing what's going on. I've kind of rambled a bit. I no, no, I love that because it's showing that the father is doing some things and, and we are behind. But the, uh, the, the American church is in diapers when it, and still drinking milk when it should be, you know, eating meat. And, and um, you know, I pray that we wake up and, you know, yeah. and but we're one of the, uh, you know, we're, we, we are one of the leaders in bringing the gospel out. Um, so those who are dedicated. But historically, <laughs> historically. Yeah. Two things have brought the body of Christ together. Yeah. And it hasn't been the outpourings like the Great Awakening in the Americas or right. the Welsh Revival or Azusa right. or anything that, like that. Historically, it's been economic trouble and persecution. Wow. Go yeah. back to go back to Rome, go back to Nazi Germany, go back to the USSR, go back to any any time in history where Christians have been involved, where the gospel has just flourished. Yeah. It's been times of economic difficulty because you've got to rely on one another. And, and then in times of persecution, you've got to know who has your back. Yeah. And I tell people, work on the relationships, invest in the relationships now, invite somebody over for dinner on a Friday night, get to know somebody. If the Lord's brought somebody across your path and, and, and you're on the same spiritual page, Hey, get together, go have, go have coffee someplace, go have some tea, yeah. you know, grab a meal, invest in the relationships because all of this around us is going to burn. Yeah. But people are eternal. Jody, you and I are still going to know each other 500 years from now. That's cool. <laughs> We're already in eternity. Yeah. So invest in that which is eternal. Yeah. Because when you're in Christ, you don't lose anything in heaven. You don't lose your memory. You don't lose any of the relationship that you have yeah. uh, with people here on the earth. It, We're going to know each other 200 years from now, 500 years from now. I love that. And I love that concept that we will share heaven together. And uh, but I did want to mention you said something that recently the Lord has moved many people out. I, I had one person call me that they, they wanted to talk right now. I couldn't do it. I had just picked up my grandson after not seeing him for a while. I said, can I call you back or can you text it? I don't want to talk in front of him. And that person doesn't won't answer any calls anymore. And um, I've had someone else do that where they thought, said something and I prayed because I felt like the Lord was giving us revelation on what to pray against. But I think they took it as something uh, like I was correcting them when I wasn't. I was praying against what. And so I'm starting to see this sensitivity and division coming and exactly what you're saying. And and some people, the Lord showed me, were being used to monitor, you know, for the enemy. They call themselves Christians, but but it was a, and I could see it in the spirit, you know, uh, oh, I see what you're doing. <laughs> And I've had to make the decision to walk away and it hurt because you love people sure. and you pray for them. But, it, but I do you, see what you're saying. Happening. Yeah. All you can do is build a bridge. And if you're met with a wall, there's nothing you can do. That's yeah. on them. Yeah, that yeah. when they build a wall, then that tells you that their problem is with Jesus, not with you. Yeah. Cause when you ask, did I offend you? I'm so sorry. Can you tell me? And they don't, then it's like, okay, I've got to let this go. Yeah. And it hurts. It's like, but we're seeing, I I've been saying it for a while on my broadcast, we're seeing where the Lord separated the sheep from the goats. And now he's separating the lions from the sheep because the lions are going to march in with him. The pride is coming. The lion of the tribe of Judah is on his way. You know, and consider, yeah. consider the type of church that Jesus himself said that he will find at his return. Mm -hmm. He he tells he describes it in Matthew 25. Mm -hmm. And he says he's going to separate the nations like one which separates sheep and goats. Mm -hmm. And he says basically to the meek, come inherit that kingdom which has been prepared for you from the beginning. Mm -hmm. And he said, because, and then he goes into hungry, thirsty, naked, mm -hmm. uh, a stranger, sick mm -hmm. and in prison. Right. And you fed me, watered me, clothed me, took me in and visited me right that's that that kind of body of christ that means you got to know one another yeah to, to feed clothe water and take somebody in yeah you've got to know them and that's the body of christ he's coming for so yeah. you got to realize he, he's good as the world as the economy hits later in the especially by summer and into the fall economy stuff happens and stuff like that um you know you're you're going to see that some of these 
distractions stripped away and it, yeah. you're going to, you, you know, you're going to have multiple generations living under one roof. You've got people who are going to decide, do we heat the house or do we eat? It's right. that kind of a thing. And it's already happening in some places mm -hmm. uh, where you have multiple generations and they're pooling their resources, but, but the intensity of it's going to be different, but um, uh, not to, to scare people, because if you're in Christ, you're in his economy. And, and if you're geared up with that mentality, with that spirituality, with that armor of God, then you're going to sail through it. You're going to walk like a giant in the land and people are going to look to you and, and be in peace. But, uh, but it's, it's man, the spirit is just saying, get serious, you know, Amen. Um, and you know, that's what it's, that's what it's about. So that's what it's know. all about is get serious. And, uh, and we, and we come together as family. So and we are one and I'm excited to know you 500 years from now. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Yeah. And we'll, um, I will let you know, we'll, we'll, um, uh, if you don't mind, I'll have you pray us out, but I want to have you come back and so we can talk about what, you know, what the Lord has showed you on the demons and the um, Nephilim and the UFO deceptions that's coming. And I'm trying to get people to see truth according to the word of God, because, you know, uh, there's so much, we have to be ready. We have to. Yeah. The, the, the teaching series I'm actually doing for this month, uh, that'll come out, uh, yeah around the 20th is, is actually about truth. Oh, good. Yeah. Uh, because one of the things that you've got to realize is we live in an era, area where era, where people are saying my truth and your truth, and they're two different truths. Right. right. And, and uh, this is about the absolute truth and, and what's happening. Let, if I could just sketch this and we'll close yes, out here. But, absolutely. Okay. I'm, I'm going to take the United States as an example. Mm -hmm. um, when it started out, it government was, good it was virtuous it was looking for the best in its sit for its citizens mm -hmm. when a nation and a government leaves the moral uprightness the virtues the moral uprightness the goodness and they start catering to the individual individual rights then what happens is individual rights become more important than the foundational rights that the nation was founded upon. And so the government finds itself having to defend every individual right, mm -hmm. no matter how perverted, no mm -hmm. matter how backwards. And that then breaks society down into all these little groups. And they all say, I want to be heard. This is true to me. This is my right. truth. This is what's true to me. Mm -hmm. So in the midst of that, Christianity is just another voice. Yeah, yeah. And so what, what the difference is, is the, the vitality, the life, the supernatural presence of God in our lives that says, no, this is the truth. Right, exactly. And and that's, you know, what you're looking at. And so anyway. Yeah, that's going to be good. I'm going to have to hook on there. Yeah, and, yeah. You know, we can do something with that. My, I, I said that to my son the other day. He said, welcome to the to the new millennium <laughs> or something like that, because we don't see eye to eye. And I said, well... <laughs> We don't have to talk about the things we don't agree on. I do love you. And, you know, but he, they think I'm a conspiracy, crazy, uh, religious fanatic. And, you know, and they, they've all served the Lord because I've worked in a church for seven years. And and so I just said, Lord, that space between train them up and when they're old, they won't depart. They go a little crazy. <laughs> I'm like, please remember them until they get to, to the end, you know, where they won't depart. But sure. um you know, so this is this is good. The absolute truth being Jesus Christ is the truth. And there are so many truths out there. It's ridiculous. Yeah. And, and, and then all this individuality causes great offense because everybody's offended by everybody else. That's right. And so, yeah, that's I mean, if you take it down, trace it on down, yeah. then it becomes a, a nation of offense. Yeah. Everyone's looking for to be offended over somebody who doesn't believe like them. And you end up with universities canceling speakers that are conservative because they can't take they they they're too sensitive and they can't take somebody who disagrees with their point of view yeah. it bill it, it becomes emotional reasoning instead of logic it's what i feel is true and, and my point is christians have done this that's what happened that's what happened before the elections that's what happened with covid right. and that's what happened so much now so many christians are are reasoning by emotion mm -hmm. i don't feel like i'm saved therefore i must not be saved or maybe i feel like god is mad at me or god is still and it's like no 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 stop going by feeling look at scripture you believe yeah. in the lord you'll be saved start taking control over your imaginations putting them down right and bringing them captive to christ and so yeah. it's a it's a process but anyway yeah. um 
Uh, so would you mind? Uh, I just want to thank you. This was so much fun. I love learning from you. You're, you're a wealth of, of wonderful uh, learning. And uh, I, I really would like to have you back on. So I'll get in touch with you after. <laughs> but um, So thank you so much. And if you don't mind praying us out and uh, yeah. anything the Lord has on your heart would be fine. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll just, just pray here. Father, thank you so much. Uh, that, that, you know, what I always ask, and I take it as, you know, in, in hindsight here and uh, that you have opened the eyes of our understanding by giving us the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of you. And that we pray for those loved ones around us and those friends that are blinded right now by the God of this world. Father, Paul's prayers in Ephesians seem to, to be the thing to focus on. And also, Father John uh, 6, 45, 46, where it says that, where the Lord said that those who learn of you uh, come to the Lord, come to the Lord Jesus and salvation. We're asking that you um, you strengthen the people that we love, that you would teach them and that you would, uh, that they would learn of you and that they would come to Jesus. Do that, Father God, by strengthening them by your spirit on the inside so that they can know the love of Christ, which is beyond knowledge. Like Ephesians 1.17 says, Father, give them the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of you so they can know the invitation that you have extended to them. We pray for those, Father God, not only of our loved ones, our kids, grandkids, etc., but Father God, we also pray for ourselves that you would give us the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of you. Help us to, to grow that backbone, to know what is absolute, to know who we, whose we are and who we serve. And let us be strong in these days, built up in you, as certain in you. And we thank you for that strength by your spirit, Father. Thank you for opening the eyes of our understanding to cause us to know things that we've never known before, that we never realized. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. I, I always say I always say revelation is something you always knew but never realized. Right. <laughs> and that's why it'll resonate right. in your spirit. And you say, Yeah, yeah, I got that. I got that. Yeah. You, you always knew it, but you never realized it, never hit the head. So yeah, isn't that funny? That's true. It's like, oh, that that does I always say that does resonate with me. <laughs> so yeah, there you yeah. go. That's so funny. Well, God bless you, everyone. Thank you. If you have any questions for John, please go to his website. Uh, Church Without Walls International, CWI.org. And and get in touch with them. Watch his series that on Wednesday nights. They're awesome. I I go. Do you get in the night? Do you watch it? I I I upload it by seven or eight in the morning on Wednesdays. A lot of people watch it, you know, in the evening or so. I try whenever because I I get so busy. I don't can't watch regular things regularly. (laughs) So but so when I can, I try to pick out and I do get the emails so I'll know okay I, that's okay. something that's, that's coming <laughs> or that's or, or you do the printouts where you can go and look at this you know what you write so yeah. uh, so I want folks to connect with you because you're a ble- such a blessing and I just there's nothing like the meat of God's word and that's what you bring so so Appreciate thank you that. and I'm gonna get in, back in touch with you so we can have you back on and right. share some more wisdom right. till next time till next time God bless everyone Bye-bye. bye bye